That's the recording started. So the talk is called Carl Jung, Psychology, Religion and His Relationship to Other Traditions. Anyway, so thanks to Tim and the Leeds Lodge for the invitation to speak. As it's turned out, there is an interesting continuity in that two weeks ago, we were discussing the possibility of a new reformation for Christianity. My talk today could be seen as a continuation of that theme. Uh, this is such a vast topic that today I will only be able to skim the surface. Also, I'm sure that some of you will already be familiar in general terms with Carl Jung and his ideas. I've therefore tried to offer as far as possible material that may be less familiar. I've had a deep interest in Jung's ideas for many years. This stems from my own spiritual awakening, which appeared to be an education in Jungian psychology. It consisted of analysis of the personal unconscious, big dreams and their interpretation, an ESP course, powerful synchronicities, and a mind-blowing encounter with the I Ching. These are all staple elements of his thinking. The figure of Jung has even appeared to me subsequently in a dream as a wise old man figure, the goal of my journey. The first question is whether his ideas are psychology, as he usually called them, or religion. In order to answer this, we have to consider two aspects, the figure that he presented to the public and his other face, the inner Jung. His intended professional appearance was that of a psychologist, therefore a scientist in some sense. However, others might assess his ideas. Here is Jung explaining this position in the Terry Lectures of 1937. I approach psychological matters from a scientific and not from a philosophical standpoint. I am dealing with religion from a purely empirical point of view. That is, I restrict myself to the observation of phenomena and I refrain from any application of metaphysical or philosophical considerations. My approach is exclusively phenomenal phenomenological. That is, it is concerned with occurrences, events, experiences, in a word with facts. He adopted this stance because he perceived that his life's task was to make his ideas as acceptable as possible to the climate of science prevalent at the time. However, he could alternatively be considered a mystic, a prophet, even the founder of a new religion, or perhaps the revival or renaissance of an old one, Gnosticism for modern times. The titles of some of his books, Modern Man in Search of a Soul and The Undiscovered Self may give a clue as to his true message. Along those lines, Richard Knoll, a clinical psychologist, argues that Jung's ideas, quote, come as much from late 19th century occultism and neo-paganism as they do from natural science. He describes the break from Freud as Jung's turning away from science and his founding of a new religion, which offered a rebirth surprisingly like that celebrated in ancient mystery cult teachings. Another commentator, Dominique Bourdin, a doctor in psychopathology and psychoanalysis, thinks that the most appropriate description of Jung is that of a prophet of the return of the religious independently of the traditional churches and pioneer of the spiritual movement of the new age, according to which we are now entering the age of Aquarius. These were both intended as fierce criticisms, but should make Jung especially interesting to theosophists. On the other side of the fence, the sociologist Paul Hilas believes that Jung is, quote, one of the three most important figures of the new age, along with Blavatsky and Gurdjieff. The Gnostic scholar and bishop Stefan Huller writes that his own Gnostic dedications have led him to, quote, modern variations on the age old theme of the Gnosis contained in theosophy, mystical Christianity and the psychology of C.G. Jung. Is it just a coincidence that Jung was born in the same year, 1875, that the Theosophical Society was founded? Let's note that whether they love him or hate him, all four writers agree that Jung was a spiritual or religious figure, not merely a psychologist. The irony about Jung's statement above is that the ideas that he was seeking to convey to the modern world were revelations gifted to him by various spiritual entities whom he encountered during what he called his confrontation with the unconscious. Some commentators have called this period somewhat generously a creative illness, others less generously a psychotic episode. Most important of these inner figures was Philemon, whom he describes as a pagan who brought to the surface a half Egyptian, half Hellenic atmosphere of a somewhat Gnostic tone. Philemon, as well as other characters in my imagination, 
brought me the decisive knowledge that there are things in the soul which are not made by the self, but which are done by them who have a life of their own. He was for me a mysterious character. Every now and then I felt like he was physically real. I walked with him in the garden and he was what the Indians called a guru to me. However, as the authority on Jung, Peter Kingsley says, when Jung came to face the next challenge of handing on this gift to the world of humans, he realized he would never get very far if he offered it as something given to him by an imaginary being. So he presented it instead in a language that was bound to reinsure and impress the language of science. On that theme, as an aside, what modern definition of the word psychology is the science of the human mind. Following the original Greek, however, it should mean the study of the psyche. Some of the original meanings of this word were the soul, spirit, the invisible, invisible animating principle or entity which occupies and directs the physical body. That's quite a difference. If only in modern times we could still define psychology as the study of the soul. Perhaps Jung was alone in re retaining the old definition. The extent to which he wished to keep these two aspects of his life separate can be seen from his determination to keep two of his books away from the public eye. Firstly, the Red Book, which was his, his account of this confrontation with the unconscious. This was eventually published in 2009, nearly 50 years after his death. Secondly, the Seven Sermons to the Dead, which he only allowed to be circulated among a few close friends and colleagues. The circumstances accompanying the genesis of this book are extraordinary. That is the second of two especially important incidents in his life that he tells in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, his sort of autobiography. Following some conversations with Philemon, Jung says that, quote, in 1916, I felt an urge to give shape to something. I was compelled from within, as it were, to formulate and express what might have been said by Philemon. It began with a restlessness, but I did not know what it meant or what they wanted of me. His house then became haunted for a whole weekend. He says, the atmosphere was thick, believe me. Then I knew that something had to happen. The whole house was filled as if there was a crowd present, crammed full of spirits. As for myself, I was all aquiver with the question, for God's sake, what in the world is this? Then they cried out in chorus, we have come back from Jerusalem where we found not what we sought. That is also the opening line of the seven sermons. Then it began to flow out of me, and in the course of three evenings, the thing was written. As soon as I took up the pen, the whole ghostly assemblage evaporated. The room quieted and the atmosphere cleared. The haunting was over. And here is the other significant incident. He says that one day, having come out of school, while looking at the local cathedral, he felt that something terrible was about to emerge into his consciousness, something appalling and blasphemous that he did not want to allow. He tormented himself for three days, then eventually gathered all his courage and let the thought come. The essence of the vision was that he saw God defecating onto the cathedral, which broke its walls asunder. He says that allowing this was a great relief. It was as though I had experienced an illumination. Why was it specifically Jung and no one else having this vision? My assumption is that it was because it was, it was his life's mission to bring the true teachings back to life, to life, to revive the church. According to the vision, God considered the cathedral, no matter how glorious and beautiful it appeared, to be something of a waste product. It was up to Jung to come up with a religion satisfactory to God. We therefore have the same theme as in the first incident. There is a need for a religion, one which cannot be found in Jerusalem, which presumably refers to the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is perceived to be devoid of true spirituality. In that context, the full title of the book is very important. It is The Seven Sermons to the Dead, written by Basilides in Alexandria, the city where the East toucheth the West. Jung appears to be saying that he is not the true author, that in effect he is channeling the spirit of an ancient Gnostic teacher who would have been considered a heretic by the Roman church from a city famous as a centre of learning and wisdom, also a city where East meets West, thus a potential synthesis of two different traditions. Or perhaps he is just being fanciful and merely pouring out his own thoughts. 
Whichever is the case, the text can be considered agnostic outpouring, and he was presumably writing what the spirits were demanding since the haunting stopped. Having written all that, I then became aware of the following quote. I do not know what sources he is referring to, but Jacques Mabi describes that incident thus. Jung entered a climax of this crisis by spending three nights secretly writing under this influence. His admirers speak of an ecstatic event and of a highly mystical writing. We can hear that he was indeed beside himself, but not by an ecstatic state of overcoming the ego, a kind of mystical rapture, rather a state of possession, at least partial, and in contact or channeling under the dictation of possessive inspiring entities. As I explained, Jung was careful in his collected works to publish only on subject matter that he considered observable and real and resisted metaphysical speculation. In this book, however, he lets himself off the leash and allows himself to write a short but complex metaphysical outpouring. For this reason, he never wanted it to be made available to anyone outside his close circle during his lifetime and regretted it when this happened without his permission. At some later point, there was a public row with the theologian Martin Buber, who openly accused him of being agnostic, which at the time he vehemently denied. However, according to his leading disciple, Marie-Louise Louise von France, he never regretted the content. Peter Kingsley elaborates, saying that even though Jung would do anything to cover his agnostic tracks, his true opinion of the Seven Sermons was, quote, something altogether wonderful, embodying a wisdom so much superior to my dull conscious mind, as a very special gift to him from the unconscious, a unique source of light and hope, the formal beginning of everything that would really matter to him, because through it he managed to express themes which would remain of the gravest importance to him for the rest of his work and the rest of his life. These two incidents, even though one is a vision and the other is distinctly paranormal, are strong indications that Jung was onto something special. In addition to his being given the task of bringing forward a religion satisfactory to God, this religion might well have close affinities with ancient Gnosticism, perhaps what Christianity might have become if it had been allowed to survive. I'll turn now to Jung's relationship to other religions, beginning with Christianity. He wrote much about it, and seemed to treat it as one of his clients in need of therapy, in need of healing through a new reformation. On that theme, John Durley says that Jung sought to give new life and relevance to what had often become dead dogma. Unsurprisingly, this attracted hostility from conventional Christians. Durley therefore concludes that Jung could be, quote, hailed as a great apologist for Christianity, but also one of its greatest heretics. It is therefore somewhat synchronistic that I've ended up giving this talk on Easter Sunday, the day when Christianity celebrates the resurrection. And as I said earlier, another coincidence is that in the last talk two weeks ago, we were talking about a revival of Christianity in a new form. So what is wrong with the Christianity that has been the foundation of Western society for 2000 years that necessitated those two incidents I've described? One obvious point is that, like other organised religions, Christianity, at least in its exoteric forms, lacks true spirituality, the search for the divine within us. It has replaced this with creeds, moral injunctions and arguably meaningless rituals. Thus, Julia Jewett, a feminist Jungian writer, refers to, quote, the reality that at one time religion was an experience of the divine energy and the accompanying reality that that experience gets codified, dogmatized and institutionalized. If we would be in touch with living religion, such as that offered by Jung is implied, with the still pulsing life energy, we must go inside, turns ego's attention toward the self in order to reconnect to our source. Jung is especially critical of Protestantism, saying that, while the Church of Rome, thanks to her unsurpassed organisation, remained a unity, Protestantism split into nearly 400 denominations. This is a proof on the one hand of its bankruptcy mm. and on the other of a religious vitality which refused to be stifled. Protestantism largely destroyed belief in the Church as the indispensable agent of divine, divine salvation. Thus, the burden of authority fell to the individual and with it a religious responsibility that had never existed before. 
Uh, apologies for the male dominated language in the quote which uh, follows. Since the way of the Protestant is not laid down for him in advance, he gives welcome, one might say, to practically any system which holds out the promise of successful development. He must now do for himself the very thing which had always been done by the church as intermediary, and he does not know how to do it. If he is a man who has taken his religious needs seriously, he has also made untold efforts towards faith, because his doctrine sets exclusive store by faith. But faith is a charisma, a gift of grace, and not a method. The Protestant is so entirely without a method. All this could have led to a search for a deeper form of Christianity. However, Jung says that on the contrary, this led to the importation on a mass scale of exotic Eastern religious systems, a development which he criticises. More of that later. Um, I hope that no TS member feels the urge to leave the meeting at this point. Turning now to some specifics. The self for Jung was the image of the divine in a human, the goal of his individuation process, a centre of wholeness of the personality where opposites are transcended and unified. The two most obvious pairs of opposites are good and evil and male and female. Jung was deeply interested in the divine feminine. Joan Chamberlain Engelsman, referring to the feminist revival, says that Jung would certainly have been interested Quote, he, Eric Neumann, and of course Esther Harding, first began talking about the goddess and the feminine decades before this new movement began. They are the ones who originally proposed the necessity of recovering the feminine, which they saw as vital for the psychic health of the world. Jung's interest in the anima and in feminine images indicates his belief that these are the images that will vivify and bring life to people in the 20th and 21st centuries. It is well known that Jung considered all humans to have a contrasexual component to their personality. For men, a female anima, referred to by Singer in that last quote, and for women, a male animus. So I won't go into a discussion of that theme. Suffice to note that towards the culmination of the individuation process, there is a sacred marriage, known as hieros gamos, between the higher aspects of the masculine and feminine principles. This was studied by Jung in his last major book, perhaps therefore the culmination of his thinking, the 556 page Mysterium Conjunctionis, subtitled An Inquiry into the Separation and Synthesis of Psychic Opposites in Alchemy. As an aside, it's interesting that Shakespeare includes a portrayal of such a marriage at the end of his esoteric play, The Tempest. Evidence that the marriage between Ferdinand and Miranda has this divine significance is that three goddesses Iris, Ceres and Juno, Queen of the Gods, attend. So, instead of saying more about Anima and Animus, I'll discuss an important event that occur occurred during Jung's lifetime. In 1950, Pope Pius XII declared the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary to be an infallible doctrine. Although it may not have been stated in so many words, the implication was that Mary had been incorporated into the Godhead. Frank McLean, one of Jung's biographers, notes that Jung immediately hailed the enunciation of this dogma as the most significant religious event since the Reformation. Why did he think that? To put it in simple Jungian terms, he presumably did not believe that Mary was divine, rather that the Catholic Church had acceded to the demands of the collective unconscious by adding a long neglected feminine aspect to the masculine trinity, which therefore turned into a quaternity. The assumption, therefore, satisfied a deep unconscious need. McLean goes on to say that, quote, the fact that Mary was now a goddess seemed to Jung to pose theological problems overlooked by the papal advisers, and that, quote, the assumption was really the Christian version of the Heros Garmos, or sacred marriage. Jung had always thought that four was the true mystical number, the symbol of wholeness and completion. Christianity's trinity was therefore by definition incomplete. As McLean says, Jung thought that the dogma of the assumption clinched the case for four as the mystical number, since it meant that the Catholic Church had tacitly abandoned the trinity in favour of a quaternity. Although it was not strictly true that there was no feminine element in the trinity, since Jung often argued that the Holy Ghost was one manifestation of Sophia, Nevertheless, the perfection of God had now been fully achieved by God's union with Sophia in the guise of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary was thus in effect a fourth member of the Godhead, so that the Trinity was now a quaternity. 
As an aside, it's interesting to note that a Gnostic name for the deity, Metropator, makes good sense when translated or rendered as Mother Father. The next pair of opposites is that of good and evil. The existence of evil has always been a problem for Christianity because of its belief that God is purely good, sometimes called the summum bonum. It therefore attributes evil to the devil or humanity's fall because of original sin. Thus, in the New Testament, the first epistle of John says, quote, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. We can find similar statements among the early church fathers. If, however, we conceive God rather as a ground of being, a oneness, which is the source of everything that exists, then we, we are drawn to the conclusion that, like the masculine and feminine principles, both good and evil have their ultimate source in that original oneness. The existence of what we call evil in the world might be a necessary aspect of creation, as the opposites separate in the process of manifestation. In the Old Testament, we have both points of view expressed. Deuteronomy says, our God is the rock, his work is perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God without deceit, just and upright is he, yet his degenerate children have dealt falsely with him, a perverse and crooked generation. However, in Isaiah we find, quote, I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and I create darkness. I make weal, which is an old fashioned word for well-being, and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. That is the New Revised Standard Version translation. I have been informed that an alternative and better translation is causing well-being and creating evil rather than I make weal and create woe. The Hebrew word translated as evil in this passage is ra, the meaning of which is to spoil, make good for nothing, afflict, do harm, hurt, punish, vex, do wickedly. Isaiah's depiction of God here seems to go against much of the rest of the Bible, especially the New Testament, and therefore Christianity. It was, however, consistent with the Gnostic tradition of Manichaeism. According to Peter Kingsley, Jung was fascinated by Mani's writings and ideas. On the other side, St. Augustine, having been involved with it, rejected Manichaeism and converted to Christianity. Since he was such an influential figure in early Christianity, this can be seen as an important turning point split in the history of the two traditions. Jung seems to belong to the camp of those who conceive God as the ground of being, the wholeness of everything that exists, an impersonal abstraction. Following Basilides of Alexandria, he called this supreme divinity Abraxas, who, according to Jacques Mabi, quote, became for Jung the efficient principle the supreme divinity or the very notion of divinity situated above Helios, the good, and the devil, the evil, neither good nor bad, the guiding principle of the process of individuation, which is the name Jung gives to his spiritual path. He calls the goal of this the self, which for him is the image of the divine in a human, a centre of wholeness of the personality where opposites are transcended and unified. He therefore conceived good and evil as equal and complementary aspects of the psyche. He wrote, in the self, good and evil are indeed closer than identical twins. The reality of evil and its incompatibility with good cleave the opposites asunder and lead inexorably to the crucifixion and suspension of everything that lives. On the same page, he talks about, quote, the truth about the self, the unfathomable union of good and evil. According to him, the unavoidable beginning of this individuation process is the integration of the shadow, the darker aspects of personality, into consciousness. It's interesting, therefore, that he said of himself, I don't aspire to be a good man, I aspire to be a whole man. Jung considered Christ to be a symbol of the self, albeit lacking this dark side. Thus he says, Christ is our nearest analogy of the self and its meaning, Yet looked at from the psychological angle, he corresponds to only one half of the archetype. The other half appears in the Antichrist. The latter is just as much a manifestation of the self, except that he consists of its dark aspect. The Christian image of the self, Christ, lacks the shadow that properly belongs to it. On that theme, in many places in his writings, Jung was highly critical of the Christian doctrine of privatio boni, the idea that evil, unlike good, is insubstantial and merely the absence of good. 
He quotes several prominent church fathers and says that this nullifies the reality of evil. Jungian writer Karim Dunn says that, psychologically speaking, the doctrine of privatio boni, quote, leads us to downplay evil as a non-being, which gives man the perfect excuse to avoid taking his shadow or dark side seriously. Also, the human soul is given an exaggerated importance as the cause of evil. A doctrine that has its roots in Origen and St. Basil the Great reaches full expression with St. Augustine and his struggle to deliver himself from Manichaeism. Since God is the creator of all things, in order to preserve both the unity and the goodness of God, as opposed to the Manichaean doctrine of two ultimate principles, one good, the other evil, an ingenious solution is hit upon by interpreting evil as non-being, not part of the creation at all, but as it were, a whole in creation. As the words ingenious solution suggest, it's possible, even likely, that this doctrine was invented purely to, in order to avoid having to contemplate the possibility that the creator is not completely good, the source of everything that exists, including evil. It's also worth noting that the doctrine seems to contradict the Bible. For in Genesis, we learn of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where the two, two seem to be considered equal and complementary opposites. Jung appeals to other evidence found in the Bible itself, namely the book of Job, concluding, as Corinne Dunn says, that God is rather a totality, being both good and evil, or to intensify the paradox, all good and all evil. She continues, but if the Christian God is none other than the God of Job and the God of Psalm 88, why is it that Christian tradition emphasizes only the bright aspects, goodness, light, love? How can the God whom Jung describes as an amoral phenomenon be the summum bonum? Turning now to the relationship and parallels between Jung's thinking and other spiritual traditions, the obvious place to start is Buddhism and its parent Hinduism, since these are the best known and popular in the West. Jung was deeply knowledgeable and complimentary about both. Writing about his 1938 journey to India, he says, by that time, I had read a great deal about Indian philosophy and religious history and was deeply convinced of the value of Oriental wisdom. He wrote that yoga offers not only the much sought way, but also a philosophy of unrivaled profundity. He says of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, for years it has been my constant companion, and to it I owe not only many stimulating ideas and discoveries, but also many fundamental insights. It is of an unexampled sublimity. He was, also, he was considered eminent and knowledgeable enough to be invited by Walter Evans Ventz to write a psychological commentary on the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation. And even though he declined to meet him, which has prompted reactions ranging from puzzlement to outright condemnation, Jung was extremely complimentary about the sage Ramana Maharshi, describing him as the latest and best incarnation of the type of the holy man, a phenomenal personage, a, mondia, a modern Indian prophet, and that Sri Ramana's thoughts are beautiful to read. Jung also praises the East for believing in the reality of the psyche as the main and unique condition of existence, a viewpoint with a close relationship to his own. Since he was highly critical of traditional Christianity and sought to establish a spirituality that would remedy its deficiencies, Jung was generally sympathetic to the Eastern attitude he says, the Christian West considers man to be wholly dependent upon the grace of God, or at least upon the church as the exclusive and divinely sanctioned earthly instrument of man's redemption. The East, however, insists that man is the sole cause of his higher development, for it believes in self-liberation. There is an obvious parallel here with the individuation process he advocated, since that is an inner search for personal illumination without reliance on any external authority although, of course, one may need the assistance of a guru or analyst. Despite all this, Jung thought that Westerners were not yet ready for this wisdom. He said, the philosophy of the East, although so vastly different from ours, could be an inestimable treasure for us too, but in order to possess it, we must first earn it. We must first earn it. If I remain so critically averse to yoga, it does not mean that I do not regard this spiritual achievement of the East as one of the greatest things the human mind has ever created. I hope my exposition makes it sufficiently clear that my criticism is directed solely against the application of yoga to the peoples of the West. 
The spiritual development of the West has been along entirely different lines from that of the East and has therefore produced conditions which are the most unfavourable soil one can think of for the application of yoga. As noted above, he attributes the importation on a mass scale of exotic Eastern religious systems to the bankruptcy of Protestantism, concluding correctly, therefore, that this is a late development in the West. Meditation and yoga are, on the contrary, traditions in the East going back many centuries. Jung believed that the West was not ready for such sophisticated practices and has more pressing psychological needs given its general unconsciousness and lack of self-awareness. The wisdom of the East was therefore, quote, a warning message to a humanity which threatens to lose itself in unconsciousness and anarchy. He also talks about Western civilization's barbarous one-sidedness. In simple terms, there is a lot of catching up to do. He says, in the East, where these ideas and practices originated, and where an un uninterrupted tradition extending over some 4,000 years has created the necessary spiritual conditions, yoga is, as I can readily believe, the perfect and appropriate method of fusing body and mind together so that they form a unity that can hardly be doubted. They thus create a psychological disposition which makes, makes possible intuitions that transcend consciousness. However, the split in the Western mind makes it impossible at the outset for the intentions of yoga to be realised in any adequate way. It becomes either a strictly religious matter or else a physical discipline and not a trace is to be found of the unity and wholeness of nature which is characteristic of yoga. The Indian can forget neither the body nor the mind while the European is always forgetting either the one or the other. The Indian not only knows his own nature but he knows also how much of him he himself is nature the European, on the other hand, has a science of nature and knows astonishingly little of his own nature, the nature within him. The European has become so far removed from his roots that his mind has finally split into faith and knowledge. His task is to find the natural man again. What therefore is the alternative? What are the significant differences between Jung's spiritual path of individuation and the East, especially Buddhism? It's possible to find some parallels. Here, Robert E. Ryan outlines what he perceives these to be. Jung is detailing the anatomy of modern despair of meaninglessness, which he had encountered in his patients. Somewhat like the Buddha, he determines that there is suffering, that suffering has a cause and that the cause can be overcome. Unlike many schools of Eastern or more ancient thought, he finds that this cause is itself a structure of consciousness. Thus for both, the ego is perceived to be the problem and the goal is the transformation of consciousness. That only takes us so far, however, because differences then begin to emerge. In Buddhism, the ego personality is considered non-existent, illusion that we must rid ourselves of. For Jung, however, the ego is an outward, limited, false personality called the persona, which is an obstacle that prevents us from realizing our true self, our wholeness, our deeper, unique personality. The goal of Hinduism and Buddhism would seem to be the same for each individual. Everyone is seeking through spiritual practice the experience of enlightenment, samadhi, moksha, a state of pure consciousness which has dissolved the ego and is free of any trace of personality, one's apparent separate identity. I assume therefore that this is an identical experience for anyone who achieves it. On the other hand, the goal of Jung's spiritual path, which he calls the individuation process, is that each person expands their consciousness in order to become the unique, unique individual that they are. Jung encouraged his clients to choose to suffer consciously in order to lead to this higher level of existence. This is accompanied by a discovery of one's own purpose or mission in life. There is presumably less importance attached to this in Buddhism and in Hinduism, which consider the material level to be the illusion of Maya or Leela, divine play. According to Jung, however, we can find meaning and value by living in a way that is authentic to us, guided by the self. We find our own way rather than living according to someone else's values or ideas. Thus, of himself, he says that during his visit to India, he was, quote, in search of myself, of the truth peculiar to myself. Elsewhere, he said, I must shape my life out of myself, out of what my inner being tells me or what nature brings to me. Here we see that he believed in his own personal truth, guided by the wisdom of the unconscious, rather than follow the traditions of others. 
Jung's spiritual path is therefore a celebration of the individual. There is no sense of seeking release or escaping the need to reincarnate. Instead, it is a spirituality of the earth in which healing follows a search for and connection with the primeval depths. It's worth noting that the idea of individuation is clearly expressed in the text of the Seven Sermons to the Dead, which, as mentioned earlier, was Jung's attempt to put into words the teachings of his inner guru Philemon, or those of the Gnostic Basilides. This is therefore the core of Jung's religion and shows that this idea goes back a long way. Is it reasonable, therefore, to see Jung, as we hopefully approach the New Age, as the climax or culmination of the Western spiritual tradition? Here is the translation of the relevant passage by Stefan Huller. This is from the Seven Sermons. You say, what harm does it not to discriminate? For then we reach beyond the limits of our own being. We extend ourselves beyond the created world and we fall into the undifferentiated state, which is another quality of the pleroma. We submerge into the pleroma itself and we cease to be created beings. Thus we become subject to dissolution and nothingness. Uh, the pleroma is a term in Gnosticism for the ultimate reality, which is both a nothingness and fullness. The quote continues, such is the very death of the created being. We die to the extent that we fail to discriminate. For this reason, the natural impulse of the created being is directed towards differentiation and toward the struggle against the ancient pernicious state of sameness. The natural tendency is called principium individuationis. This principle is indeed the essence of every created being. From these things, you may readily recognize why the undifferentiated principle and lack of discrimination are all a great danger to created beings. Staying in the East, I'll now turn to China and Taoism. The relevant topics are Jung's deep friendship with the distinguished sinologist Richard Wilhelm and the two books on which they collaborated, Wilhelm's translation of the I Ching and the secret of the golden flower. It can be argued that Wilhelm was responsible more than any other, perhaps even solely, for opening up the vast spiritual heritage of China to the West. He was a linguist and a scholar, but also a spiritual seeker. According to Jung, a truly religious spirit with an unclouded and far-sighted view of things. Wilhelm was this mind which created a bridge between East and West and gave to the Occident the precious heritage of a culture thousands of years old, a culture perhaps destined to disappear. It became his life's mission to create a bridge between Western and Eastern spirituality. The relationship between Wilhelm and Jung had a profound effect upon the latter. He wrote, Wilhelm's life work is of such great value to me because it explained and confirmed so much of what I had been seeking, striving for, thinking and doing in order to meet the psychic suffering of Europe. They talked a great deal about Chinese philosophy and religion. Jung says that what he told me out of his wealth of knowledge of the Chinese mentality clarified some of the most difficult problems that the European unconscious had posed for me. On the other hand, what I had to tell him about the results of my investigations of the unconscious caused him no little surprise, for he recognised in them things he had considered to be the exclusive possession of the Chinese philosophical tradition. It would seem, therefore, that there is a meaningful connection between Jung's psychological discoveries and the ancient wisdom of Taoism. We can assume that what Jung calls the collective unconscious was responsible for this. The Taoist book of wisdom and oracle, the I Ching, was the passion of Wilhelm's Chinese teacher, Lao Nai Xuan, a sage and scholar who profoundly influenced his life. In Wilhelm's words, Lao first opened my mind to the wonders of the Book of Changes. Under his experienced guidance, I wandered in trance through this strange yet familiar world. Lao was an adept at Chinese yoga and psychological methods from the Taoist tradition. He realised that China's isolation from the rest of the world had to end, so that for the first time, the deep spiritual tradition of China was shared with the European. It would seem that his life's mission was to reveal the secrets of Chinese spirituality to the West, and that it was Wilhelm's mission to communicate them, thereby creating a bridge between Eastern and Western spirituality. I suggest, therefore, that this was one of the most important relationships of recent times for humanity in general. Jung says, Wilhelm fulfilled his mission in the highest sense of the word. Not only did he make accessible to us the 
past treasures of the Chinese mind, but as I have pointed out, he brought with him its spiritual root, the root that has remained alive all these thousands of years and planted it in the soil of Europe. Together, Lao and Wilhelm translated the I Ching from Chinese into German, a task which continued for 10 years. Jung notes, when the last page of the translation was finished and the first printer's proofs were coming in, the old master Lao Nai Suan died. It would seem that his mission had been completed. Jung's forward to the I Ching is very interesting and worth reading. It does not add much to today's theme, however, except to note his attempt to explain the mystery of the great power of this oracle where meaningful answers are the rule. He rejects the traditional Chinese explanation that spiritual agencies are at work acting in a mysterious way and that the book is considered a sort of animated being. Adopting a somewhat more modern attitude, Jung says that nothing occult is to be inferred and that in the field of psychotherapy and medical psychology, there are many unknown quantities. His alternative hypothesis is synchronicity, thus a meaningful correspondence between the inner and outer worlds. Rationalists might consider this also to be a somewhat occult explanation. On that theme, he says that this Chinese tradition seems unconcerned with linear time and causality in contrast with modern Western science. <clears throat> it sees rather an interconnectedness of everything in any given moment, quote, a peculiar interdependence of objective events among themselves, as well as with the subjective, so sorry, subjective psychic states of the observer or observers. Next, I'll discuss the other Taoist texts on which they collaborated, Wilhelm's translation of The Secret of the Golden Flower. Wilhelm says that the book comes from an esoteric circle in China with two strands, magical practices and spiritualism, alongside a mystical movement devoted to meditation and yoga. The followers of this method, according to Wilhelm, quote, achieve almost without exception the central experience. Thus it can be said that, as far as the Chinese psyche is concerned, a completely assured method, method of attaining definite psychic experiences is available. Jung calls the book this unique treasure and says it contains the subtle psychic experiences of the greatest minds of the East. He further says that this text was critical for my own work. I had been occupied with the investigation of the processes of the collective unconscious since the year 1913 and had obtained results that seemed to me questionable in more than one respect. My results, based on 15 years of effort, seemed inconclusive because no possible comparison offered itself I knew of no realm of human experience with which I might have backed up my findings with some degree of assurance. He had searched for relevant material among the Gnostics, but for various reasons found this unsatisfactory. Then the text that Wilhelm sent me helped me out of this embarrassment. It contained exactly those pieces which I had sought for in vain among the Gnostics. This was because it not only a Taoist tact, sorry, Taoist text of Chinese yoga, but also an alchemical tract, and that the alchemical nature of the text is of prime importance. As is well known, Jung made a deep study of Western alchemy, believing that it was a projection of unconscious psychic processes and a connecting link between ancient Gnosticism and the processes of the collective unconscious he observed in his clients. It was the foundation for much of his later work. It is especially significant, therefore, that he says that it was the text of the golden flower that first put me in the direction of the right track. He further says, I did not have a knowledge, however inadequate, for Chinese philosophy as a starting point. On the contrary, when I began my life work in the practice of psychiatry and psychotherapy, I was completely ignorant of Chinese philosophy. And only later did my professional experience show me that in my technique, I had been unconsciously led along that secret way which has been the preoccupation of the best minds of the East for centuries. Richard Wilhelm, that great interpreter of the soul of China, fully confirmed the parallel for me. This gave me the courage to write about a Chinese text which belongs entirely to the mysterious shadows of the Eastern mind. At the same time, and this is the extraordinary thing, in context, it is a living parallel to what takes place in the psychic development of my patients, none of whom is Chinese. Again, we can assume that what Jung calls the collective unconscious was responsible for this. Jung finds equivalence in the text for his understanding of animus and anima, 
And more importantly, he finds other parallels in the text's extensive use of symbols, including the mandala, which, as he says, is not only to be found all over the East, but also among us. He points out that the golden flower of the title is itself a mandala and says that our text promises to reveal the secret of the golden flower of the Great One. The golden flower is the light and the light of heaven is the Tao. The fifth German edition of that book contains a foreword by Wilhelm's wife, Salome. She writes of the accompanying Hui Ming Ching, which was a later Taoist text written in 1794, Quote, the text combines Buddhist and Taoist directions for meditation. The basic view is that at birth, the two spheres of the psyche, consciousness and the unconscious, become separated. Consciousness is the element marking what is separated off, individualized in a person, and the unconscious is the element that unites him with the cosmos. The unification of the two elements via meditation is the principle upon which the work is based. The unconscious must be inseminated by consciousness being immersed in it. In this way, the unconscious is activated and thus, together with an enriched consciousness, enters upon a suprapersonal mental level in the form of a spiritual rebirth. This rebirth then leads first to a progressing inner differentiation of the conscious state into autonomous thought structures. However, the conclusion of the meditation leads of necessity to the wiping out of all differences in the fun, integrated life, which is free of opposites. We can easily understand, therefore, why Jung was so impressed by the parallels between his own thinking and Taoism. Moving now to the Middle East, our discussed Sufism, which, as far as I can tell, seems to be the esoteric tradition the closest to Jung's ideas. He was a close friend of the French scholar Henri Corbin, probably the greatest West, Western expert ever on the Sufi mystical tradition, and who almost single-handedly introduced Persian spiritual wisdom to the West. Jung says that, quote, Henri Corbin was the one person who understood him far better than anybody else, that it was Corbin who had given him not only the rarest of experiences, but the unique experience of being completely understood. It was presumably the correspondence between Jung's thinking and Corbin's extensive knowledge of Sufi ideas which allowed this deeper connection between them. A relevant question for today's talk, which Sufism addresses, is how real were Jung's visionary experiences, especially those described in the Red Book? Were they in any sense objectively real or were they illusions, hallucinations, madness, as modern psychiatrists might and do sometimes claim? The most important teaching of Philemon, Jung's inner guru, was psychic objectivity, the reality of the psyche. Jung says, he said, I treated thoughts as if I generated them myself, but in his view, thoughts were like animals in the forest or people in a room or birds in the air, and added, if you should see people in a room, you would not think that you had made those people or that you were responsible for them. In his book, Alone with the Alone, Corbin describes the view of the Sufi mystics on this issue. He talks about a universe endowed with a perfectly objective existence and perceived precisely through the imagination. OK, I'm going to go a bit slower on this bit because this is really important. This is a quote. The world is objectively and actually threefold. Between the universe that can be apprehended by pure intellectual perception, which is the universe of the cherubic intelligences, and the universe perceptible to the senses, there is an intermediate world, the world of idea images, of archetypal figures, of subtile substances, of immaterial matter. This world is as real and objective, as consistent and subsistent as the intelligible and sensible worlds. These Sufi mystics believe therefore in the objective existence of an intermediate world where prophetic inspiration and theophanic visions have their place. This intermediate world would seem to be the same realm that Jung encountered in his confrontation with the unconscious. And it is interesting to note that Corbin uses the same term as Jung, active imagination, to describe the means of entering this inner world. And as June Singer, a Jungian agnostic writer says, an archetypal world that is superordinate to this world and influences the world we know in ways about which we are unconscious is also a Gnostic concept. Uh, there is much more similar material in Corbin's book that I have to omit for time considerations today. 
As is well known, dream interpretation is the central feature of Jung's psychotherapeutic method. As far as I can tell, of all the major spiritual traditions, Sufism places the greatest emphasis on the significance of dreams and their interpretation. In modern Sufism, one figure who finds a deep connection with Jung's ideas, especially the importance of dreams, is Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, who has written two books relevant to today's talk. The first is entitled Catching the Thread, Sufism, Dreamwork and Jungian Psychology which I'll discuss here. The second is entitled Return of the Feminine and the World Soul. I haven't read it, but the title suggests that it has strong connections with Jung's thinking on Christianity. A big influence on Vaughan Lee is the Sufi teacher Irina Tweedy, author of Daughter of Fire. She wrote the foreword to the first of his books and he frequently quotes her. Until her retirement, Mrs. Tweedy held meditation meetings in her home in London, where her group worked extensively with dreams, as her teacher had done. I was fortunate to, to attend those meetings for a while and participated in this dream sharing and interpretation. As the epigram to his book, Vaughan Lee quotes her, dream work is the modern equivalent of the ancient Sufi teaching stories. In a chapter entitled The Alchemical Opus One, The Transformation of the Shadow, Vaughan Lee opens with a well-known quote from Jung as his epigram. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. He then quotes Tweedy, describing what this process was like for her. This is Mrs. Tweedy. I had hoped for instructions in yoga, expected wonderful teachings. This is presumably a reasonable expectation when enlisting with a guru in India. However, what the teacher did was mainly to force me to face the darkness within myself, and it almost killed me. In other words, he made me descend into hell. The cosmic drama enacted in every soul as soon as it dares lift its face to the light. This introduces another strong connection between Sufism and Jung, since the descent into the underworld, or hell, or confrontation with the unconscious, is an essential ingredient of his individuation process. Vaughan Lee has chapters on the transformation of the shadow, the pain of the collective shadow, the inner feminine and her dual nature, and symbols of the self. There are also three chapters on the alchemical opus. He also reports many dreams which refer to what Jung would call the individuation process. It's also worth noting that medieval Sufi mystics, for example Ibn Arabi, were interested in alchemy and understood it in the same way as Jung, as processes, processes of psychological transformation. All this establishes strong connections between Sufism and Jung's thinking. Staying in the Middle East, I've always been struck by the close correspondence between the opening of Jung's seven sermons and Kabbalistic thinking. This is Jung's text. I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as fullness. In infinity, full is no better than empty. Nothingness is both empty and full. As well might you say anything else of nothingness, as for instance, white is it, or black, or again, it is not, or it is. A thing that is infinite and eternal hath no qualities, since it, since it hath all qualities. This nothingness or fullness we name the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease, since the eternal and infinite possess no qualities. In it no being is, for he would then be distinct from the pleroma, and would possess qualities which would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma. In the pleroma there is nothing and everything. It is quite fruitless to think about the pleroma, for this would mean self-dissolution. This is remarkably similar to a passage from A Kabbalistic Universe by the late Zev ben Shimon Halevi, who on the occasion of his 80th birthday gave a talk at the Theosophical Society London. He writes, God the transcendent is called in Kabbalah Ayin. Ayin means nothing. Ayin is beyond existence, separate from anything. Ayin is absolute nothing. Ayin is not above or below, neither is Ayin still or in motion. There is nowhere where Ayin is, for Ayin is not. Ayin is soundless, but neither is it silence, nor is Ayin a void. And yet out of the zero of Ayin's nothingness, comes the one of Enzof. Enzof in Hebrew means the endless. As the one to the zero of Ayin, Enzof is the absolute all to Ayin's absolute nothing. 
God the transcendent is Ayin, and God the imminent is Enzov. Both nothing and all are the same. Beyond the titles of Ayin and Enzov, no attributes are given to the Absolute. God is God, and there is nothing to compare with God. There isn't enough time to talk about it today, but there is also a meaningful connection between Jung and the ancient and continuing tradition of shamanism, enough for at least two interesting books to be written about it. But on that theme, here's an interesting quote. Jung found his ideas more in tune with Maasai tribesmen and Pueblo Indian elders than with the sophisticated culture of early 20th century Europe. In conclusion, Jung believed that humans are naturally religious. Nietzsche said that we have killed God. Perhaps God is not dead, however, rather something has died in many people in the increasingly secular West. I assume, of course, that doesn't apply to any of you here today. Jung believes that real the reality of religion is embedded in the fabric of the human soul and that it finds inevitable expression in the consciousness that arises from such depths. As such, religion cannot be eradicated from the human condition. He contends that the reality of religion, when it loses its specifically religious trappings, reappears in the guise of political, social or philosophical and cultural notions, or indeed in anything to which can be appended the suffix ism. That would obviously include atheism. When science becomes worshipped as religion, it is called scientism. Jung therefore considered the study and engagement of world religions to be indispensable in the psychotherapeutic treatment of individuals, especially in the second half of life. He has been described as a master of finding common ground in the major spiritual traditions of the world. I hope that I have persuaded you all of that today. Here again is Stefan Huller. The thought of C.G. Jung is currently receiving an increasing amount of sympathetic interest in Western culture. A synthesis of human knowledge seldom before achieved by anyone discloses itself to those who seriously investigate the work bequeathed to us by this remarkable man. Beginning as a physician concerned with the welfare of the mind, he discovered in his patients and in his own soul the great truth of the reality of the psyche, and he explored its phenomenology at a depth to which others did not dare venture. His systematic observation of the workings of the deepest strata of the human mind in turn enable him to cast his glints with singular insight in, into the great forces within human culture, myth, religion, art, philosophy and literature. If we therefore consider the Theosophical Society's second founding principle to encourage the study of comparative religion, philosophy and science, I hope I have shown that it's hard to imagine a better example than Carl Jung. I'll end where I began with the ambiguity between psychology and religion. At a talk in New York in 1937, Jung said, people sometimes call me a religious leader. I am not that. I have no message, no mission. I attempt only to understand. We are philosophers in the old sense of the word, lovers of wisdom. It should be noted, however, as Peter Kingsley points out, that Jung was quite capable of lying when it suited him in order to preserve the public image he sought. So did he have a message and a mission? In a letter towards the end of his life, he wrote, I have failed in my foremost task to open people's eyes to the fact that man has a soul, that there is a tre buried treasure in the field, and that our religion and philosophy are in an lamentable state. Perhaps he did, after all, believe he was on a mission. It is somewhat disconcerting and depressing to hear that Jung, after everything he had achieved, thought his life had been a failure. Fortunately, however, his legacy continues and grows. It is hopefully not too late. Our current generation may be able to fulfill his task for him. Um, that's sort of the, the end of the talk. There's just a little thing that I'd like to read you. It's only one page for a book. This is possibly an, an apocryphal story and may not be complete in all its details, but it is, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful page in this book, um, uh, which I'll tell you about afterwards if you like. Okay, so this is a story uh, told by uh, somebody that Jung knew in his early days. So it's a bit like one of those jokes where an Englishman, Irishman and a Scotsman go into a bar. So it's, uh, it reads like this. It is about three women who meet and begin talking about their lives. The first one says something like this. Well, you know, my life was most unhappy and unfulfilled, and I was blanketed in the most profound depression until I consulted the most wonderful psychiatrist in Kuznacht. 
Not only did he treat my depression, he has given me the tools to develop a whole new orientation to life and has helped me to understand the value and meaning of my depression. Well, isn't that extraordinary, said the second woman. I have also been seeing someone in Kuznar, but my man is a religious prophet. He has shown me a new way of looking at God and how I as an individual can connect with God and develop a profound and independent relationship with him. I have found this has helped me immensely in my day-to-day -day life. This is quite unbelievable, exclaimed the third woman. I have also been to Kuznaft, but I have been to see a mystical healer, a modern shaman, if I have ever met one. He has helped me to discover the hidden meaning of life and has cured me in much the same way as the Navajo medicine man or Asclepius at Epidavros. I think you can draw the conclusion as to who they were all seeing. Thank you very much.